Today on the Truman Show, our guest is Dr. Jeff Tarrant. He is the founder and director of Psychic Mind Science and Neuro Meditation Institute in Eugene, Oregon. He has written two books and he has dedicated all his life scanning brains of individuals trying to understand how our consciousness evolves and how we can improve our mental states. He's a licensed psychologist and board certified in neural feedback. I had an interesting and rather intriguing conversation with this human being and we talked about a lot of subjects on how we can improve our intuition so that we can improve our thoughts and our decision making so that you can improve your everyday life and a little bit into the esoteric zones of how human consciousness works and how we might all be connected as one and how the brain might just be acting as a filter filter of our reality enjoy the Truman Show brain is amazing isn't it <laughs> yes it is <laughs> it is a uh, really i don't know how do you say it it's a typical and weird organ and uh, there is more than a lifetime to study from what you know i presume right I, you know it's one of those things that the more i learn the more i realize i don't know anything uh <laughs> I, you know so I guess that's a good thing. I guess that's a good sign, right? When you start to realize that you don't know as much as you think you know. Right, 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 right. Uh, let's talk about the different uh, different waves that the brain emits, like alpha, delta, beta, and gamma. So long story short, when we go to sleep, we are in delta, right? Correct me if I'm wrong on this. Well, no, you're, you're, you're right, sort of, but it's a little more complicated because the reality is the brain makes all of the different brain waves all the time mm -hmm. uh, and everywhere in the brain. And so, you know, sometimes when we talk about it, we simplify it, right? Where, and we say, oh, well, meditation is this or sleeping is this. The reality is we still have the other brain waves. So it's really more like a, a, a distribution of brain waves. Mm -hmm. So when we're in a deep sleep, we're going to usually have a lot more Delta than we have during waking. Mm -hmm. And so the, the ratio of different brain waves changes and that changes our consciousness. And so that actually becomes really relevant for some of the other work, right? Because if we're talking about psychic states or we're talking about meditation, how are the brain waves shifting and moving around and how does that affect our consciousness? Hmm. So wakeful, we are in beta and uh, uh, I, I do a little bit of meditation myself and I know about your neuro meditation institute and you are deeply fascinated on the topic and you study about it a lot and you spend your life scanning brains and you <laughs> <laughs> you can share a lot on the topic. So what happens in the brain when we meditate or what's different happening when we are in a normal stage and when we meditate? Uh, what happens to the human psyche or the human consciousness? Yeah. So that's a, that's obviously a huge question, right? Like that's the, that, that's the whole podcast right there. in one question, <laughs> uh, um, you know, but the, so the first kind of challenge is that <clears throat> there are different kinds of meditation, right? And mm -hmm. they're, they don't all impact the brain the same way. Uh, so the brain is very sensitive to how you're using your attention and your intention. So well, depending on how we're using those in a state of meditation, for example, it's going to <clears throat> affect the brain differently. So just to give an, a quick example, if somebody's doing what we would call a focus meditation, right? So like a concentration practice, mm 
where maybe your whole attention is on your breath and you're just watching your belly expand and contract and you're not thinking about anything else. And then when the mind wanders, you catch it wandering and you bring it back to the breath, right? So a practice like that, what's actually happening in the brain, there's two primary things. One of them is you're activating your frontal lobes, that they're actually becoming more active because you're holding your attention on one thing, which actually requires a certain level of activation, you know, to hold your attention in one spot that that's not just nothing, right? Like you, you Mm -hmm. have to, there's some level of work involved for the brain to do that. So you're actually activating your frontal lobes, but at the same time, you're shutting down the default mode network. And this is a big network in the brain that kind of organizes your personality. It organizes how you think about yourself and how you think about the world. It's kind of a structure for the person. And so that actually gets really quiet because you're not thinking about yourself or you shouldn't be, right? So there's kind of these two different dynamics that are happening simultaneously with a focus practice. But then if you look at somebody who's doing something like a loving kindness practice, right? Which we would Mm -hmm. call, we put it in a category called open heart. That's the category we use. Well, that's very different right? Because you're activating an emotional state, love, compassion, joy, forgiveness, gratitude, whatever. And usually you're then intending those feelings towards somebody else, right? Somebody you love or your neighbor or your kids or whatever. And so you're going to activate different parts of the brain. You're going to activate parts of the brain that have to do with empathy, and have to do with perspective taking and have to do with emotion. Mm -hmm. And you're actually not turning anything off because even though this is kind of a selfless practice, it still involves you. If I'm sending loving kindness thoughts to my family, well, I can't take myself out of the equation because they're my family, right? That's the way I think about them. I have a connection to them. They're part of my narrative. So it's a very different kind of activation pattern in the brain than you would see with focus. So it gets really tricky. Uh, And this is where I have a lot of fun is trying to figure out like, well, how are the different meditation states affecting the brain differently? And if we can understand that, how can we use that to our benefit? You know, are there certain meditations that might be better for certain things? for anxiety or depression or ADHD or whatever, because they're affecting the brain differently. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? There's a lot of science going on telling that meditation can make you superhuman in some level, at least apart from the fact that it can help you with depression, anxiety, all those stuff. It can make you superhuman. It can make you available to a lot of information, which is not available to you otherwise. And just like what we are saying about the default mode network, it's it's somewhat becoming like bipolar, isn't it? You're switching your person, you're switching off your default personality, and and and, and I don't know, changing into a new one that's completely new. Yeah. So you know, depending on again that idea of attention and intention. Mm-hmm. So you know, certainly we can use meditation for mental health but there's other intentions, right? Like our intention could be to open up to psychic information, information that we might not normally have access to. Okay. Well, what parts of the brain do we need to quiet down or activate in order to access that? So again, if we can understand that, then we can engage in practices that will encourage the brain into those patterns. And so making it easier, uh, you know, to access that. Yeah. Before we go there, sorry. Uh, Do you, do you believe that psychic powers exist because it's a bit into the woohoo side and, and it is out of the grasp of science and you have done a lot of research on this and you even have published a book recently. So do you believe in that or do you have evidence for that? 
<laughs> um, so first question, do I believe in it? Uh, yes. And my current feeling about psychic abilities or telekinesis or spirit communication, all of those kinds of things, my current belief is that it's actually a very natural ability that humans have, uh, that we're born with. And then as the brain develops and as we become more enculturated, that we actually close that down. And hmm, that's you know, interesting. We, we, yeah. I mean, we know that the brain, a lot of what the brain does is actually filters out information. That's a huge yeah. function of what the brain does. It contains things. It keeps things very, very much right here, right? Like mm -hmm. all I want to pay attention to is what's right in front of my face. Nothing else exists. Nothing else is real. And the brain is very good at that. And so over time, depending on your culture, your family, your training, your education, we start to shut down the ability to connect with those things. You know, little kids do that very naturally. They have invisible friends. They talk to spirits. They connect with nature. That's normal for them. They just do it. But then they hit a certain age and all of a sudden they don't do it anymore. Right. It's mm -hmm. like the mm -hmm. brain, the brain actually develops and speeds up as you get older. And part of that speeding up is this kind of closing down <laughs> and restricting information. Uh, so, so that being said, I also don't think I, I still have a, a fair amount of skepticism, right? I mean, I am, I am trained as a scientist, so I, I don't just believe everything that shows up on YouTube. Uh, mm -hmm. right. You know, so, um, so I think there's also a lot of ways that humans delude themselves, right. That we, we, we think something is one thing when it's not, we, we trick ourselves. And so I think both are true. I think psychic abilities are real. And I think we could, we trick, we confuse ourselves and we trick ourselves into believing things that maybe aren't true <laughs> all the time. So this is what makes this field very challenging. You know, how do you kind of study this? And so you were asking about like evidence. Is there any research evidence? Yes, I know you have conducted a lot of interviews and you, you, you have dedicated your whole life towards this. So maybe you can enlighten us with that. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, most of the research that I've done in this field has been more what, you know, what we would consider more like case studies. Mm -hmm. And so from a scientific perspective, they're not as useful, right? Because scientists like to have large trials with a bunch of people all doing the same thing. And, you know, um, I feel like that's tricky in this kind of field because not, not everybody works the same way. So if you take a, you know, if you take a group of 10 mediums that theoretically communicate with the deceased, mm -hmm. well, they may all have very different ways that they do that, how they connect in, how they receive the information, how they translate it, how they, you know, verbally explain that to somebody else. And so then from a lab, you know, if we put them in a lab and say, okay, everybody has to do the exact same thing. And here's how it's going to work, right? I'm going to give you a picture and you're going to look at it and you've got one minute to, to tell me some information about them. And then, you know, it, it becomes very artificial. And so it's tricky because scientists, that's how we like to do things. We like things to be controlled, but this is a field where I don't think controlling things <laughs> is always the way to get the Cer best information. Certainly it's a limit of science, right? It is. Yeah. But it makes you wonder if you can always, it's, if it's always best to think like a scientist. And I'm not sure it is, uh, you know, um, but what's interesting is that other researchers, there's actually a very large field of research that's been done on psychic abilities, you know, ESP, telepathy, uh, psychokinesis, micro psychokinesis. Mm 
which is, you know, moving small things with your intention, mm-hmm. with your mind. And by small things, usually it's like information in a computer, right? So <laughs> stuff that you can't see with the naked eye. And, you know, the evidence is pretty clear from the research that humans can do this. The problem is that the effects are usually very small. <laughs> and okay. so from a it's- real world perspective, who cares, right? Because it's just not, you know, like you psycho- yeah, yeah. How useful is it? Right. Cause it's such a small effect. Um, but the research is very clear and, you know, anybody that's read any of Dean Radin's books, you know, he's written, I don't know, five or six or seven books. And he really is a genius at summarizing the research that's already been done in the field. And he's done a lot of it himself and, you know, and kind of summarized it to say, look, here's what we know realistically about whatever the topic is. And, uh, so it, it kind of makes my job easier in some ways. Cause I don't have to do that. Right. I, I can point to that and go like, people have already done this. Like we, we know that these things exist, but we don't understand them. And, and why does it work sometimes? And it doesn't work sometimes. <laughs> and, you know, how can we get better at this and how can we get results that are maybe a little bit more impactful? Uh, you know, uh, so that's kind of where I, I think I fall you know, in, in some of that sciencey perspective. Okay. Did you have any, had any goosebumps moment when you were doing one of any of your key studies, experimenting or studying these people? Can you share a story? <laughs> sure. Uh, I've had several goosebump moments. Um, okay. You know, but, um, you know, probably uh I'll share one that I don't think I've shared on any other podcast so far, Um, you know, but so the, the first time that I was doing a brain map, so measuring the, the, the brainwave activity of um, a medium, her name's Laura Lynn Jackson, and she's very well known. She's written a couple of, you know, New York times, bestseller books. And um, actually we're doing a workshop together next weekend. So we've, we've remained friends. Mm -hmm. Um, but the very first time that I met her was at a conference, this was 10 or 11 years ago. And I, she didn't know me. I didn't know her, uh, but she agreed to be part of my little experiment. And, uh, and so I hooked her up and was measuring her brain, got a baseline and then had her do a psychic reading and had her do, uh, a mediumship reading. And even though from a scientific perspective, it probably wasn't the best way to do it. I decided I was going to have her read me. Right. So from a scientific perspective, that's not great. Right. Because I'm the researcher and I'm the subject, (laughs) Uh, (laughs) but I couldn't help myself and said, Hey, why don't you read me? And so it was interesting because I was doing my best to keep like stone face. Right. Cause I'm like looking at the EEG trying not to give her any information, you know, from my facial expressions. I yes, mean, I just no sat body there. language, no cues, nothing. Yeah. I just sat there like this, you know, nothing. <laughs> right. And so when she was doing the mediumship reading, I mean, she said a lot of things that were actually, I'll start with the psychic reading because, you know, again, she didn't really know me. She just met me at this conference. And so, she, you know, she's launching into all this information and, and, you know, she was like, You've got two kids. Yes. Uh, the older one's a girl, the younger one's a boy. Yes. Describe their personalities perfectly. And they're, they're both very different from each other. Um, mm-hmm. Yes. So she's nailing all this stuff. And then she starts saying stuff about my future. She's like, it looks, I think you're going to Hawaii a couple of times in the next couple of years. Never been to Hawaii. Uh, I think you're going to do some more research in New York. And actually, I think you're going to work with Joanne Gerber. Um, and actually, I think you're going to do something in New Jersey too. You know, I'm like, oh, okay. And literally every single one of those things happened. Um, but they didn't happen till two years later or whatever, you know. And so it's interesting because in the moment I'm going, sure, yeah, that that sounds great. Um, but literally every one of those things happened. I worked with Joanne Gerber. I did research in New Jersey and New York. I ended up going to Hawaii three times, actually, in the next four years. Um, 
Uh, so it might still be giving you goosebumps. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and in the mediumship reading, she was that was kind of fun too because, you know, she started off. Oh, I'm getting. I think it's. A, I think it's your grandpa, on your mom's side. Okay. You know, I, I'm of a certain age. You could guess that my grandpa was probably deceased, right? So I was like, well, all right, whatever. And then she, and then she goes, okay, I'm getting the name. I don't know. Maybe it's a, maybe it starts with a J or G. And then she says, Giuseppe. I was like, holy crap. Okay. It's my grandpa's <laughs> name. You're not going to wow. guess Giuseppe, right? <laughs> you know. um, uh, especially since my last name is Tarrant, right? Like, you're not going to guess that my... I've got a whole Italian side of my family and that was my grandpa's name. Uh, mm -hmm. So stuff like that is pretty, it makes it hard to argue with, right? It's like when you, when you see stuff like that, it's like, whoa, I don't know where she's getting this information, but it's pretty impressive. What's happening in the brain during the process? Can all people access these kind of states or can I turn myself into a medium or a reader or, or alter my psyche? <laughs> <laughs> Um, maybe, um, so okay. it, it, it's, it's interesting because, um, even though I've looked at a, quite a few different mediums at this point, you know, maybe, I don't know, 20 of them or 30, I'm not sure. Um, there are some fairly common patterns that you see mm -hmm. in the brain, but there's also a lot of differences, which is interesting. So to me, it kind of seems like different mediums have different ways of getting the brain out of the way to access the information. So some of them use similar approaches to do that. And others of them have found a different, a different loophole, right. To kind of tap in. And so there certainly are parts of the brain that show up a lot. And so that's what we're kind of trying to target with some of our work, right. Is it's like, well, if we keep seeing these certain brain regions, over and over again, there's probably something to that. And so what if we try to, through meditation or through using technology, downshift the activity in those areas and see if that can help people? And our preliminary results suggest that, in fact, it does help people to tap in uh, into a you know much quicker and in a deeper level. Um, but the other thing I would say is that you also have to practice the skills associated with whatever mediumship or psych. Like it's not just going to all of a sudden make you psychic, right? It's like, Oh, I zap mm -hmm. my brain. And I, I think of it like meditation. We can use technology to assist with meditation, but if I just take one of my devices and stick it on my head and turn it on, it's not going to make me an expert meditator. Uh, it's, it's a tool, right? It can help me but I still have to learn how to meditate. I still have to use my own mind and learn how to kind of navigate it into those areas. So I feel like it's a very similar process. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that our brain is stopping us from seeing a larger reality. Is that it? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah. So another analogy, but I think it's a, I think it's actually a pretty good one is, you know, the, with the current research with psychedelics. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you see with psychedelics is that when people are in a psychedelic state, it actually, the main function on the brain is it shuts down the default mode network, which we just talked about a few minutes ago. It, it, it disrupts it. So what that means is the way that we normally organize information about the world, the way we see ourselves, the way we see the world, kind of goes away for a while. So what that means is then all of a sudden you have access to more information. And this is what happens in a psychedelic state. People have insights that they wouldn't normally have. They have different perspectives. They see themselves differently. They see their history differently. They see their connection to their ancestors differently because you're not limited anymore by the structure of the default mode network. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that there's a fair number of psychics and mediums that, that also shut down their default mode network when they're working. So sometimes it's just a portion of it. Sometimes it's big chunks of it. And so in some ways they're kind of, uh, 
I'm not saying they're in a psychedelic state, but they they have to get themselves out of the way, their idea of themselves in order to access more information. Mm -hmm. So as we grow up, the brain wants to cut down these kind of abilities in some manner. The default mode network is a new area of research, is, isn't it? And, and, and is there a way we, people can learn to switch off that default mode network so that they can access more of their capacity? Sure. Yeah. I mean, again, we keep kind of going back to meditation, but it's, 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 the, it's the easy answer. Because, mm -hmm. you know, even though I was saying before that different meditations do different things in the brain, the one thing that's fairly consistent, <laughs> I say fairly because there's always exceptions, okay, <laughs> is quieting down the default mode network, right? So focus meditations mm -hmm. do that. Mindfulness meditations do that. Uh, transcendental meditation, Zen, all of those kinds of practices quiet down the default mode network. So the idea is that you're not thinking about yourself. I say it in air quotes, right? Because from like a Buddhist perspective, they would say, well, there is no self. That's, that's a myth, right? That mm -hmm. your, your brain created that idea that you're this little individual self and you're separate from everybody else. Um, in reality, that doesn't exist. <laughs> and so you learn to shift into a state where you don't think about yourself. And when you do that, you're kind of out of the way, at least for the moment. Mm -hmm. I remember reading a story. Uh, I was reading this book from Michael Singer. It's called The Surrender Experiment. And he kinds of talks about this a little bit. Uh, you don't know what's happening. Like everything, so much has happened before you. Like stars came in, galaxies came in, multiple galaxies came in. And everything came in before you. And all this self-organized and is happening before you and humans are just at the tip and what makes you wonder that you are separate or you have some kind of will and that kind of like opened my mind and uh <laughs> is, is that i i researching about you i saw a little bit you talk about the the god spot in the brain right you named that i guess Correct me if I'm wrong again. I'm wrong again. But yeah, let's talk about the God spot. What what is that? Yeah, so so the God spot is this region in the right parietal lobe. So kind of this the back right corner of the brain. And uh it got its name actually from um so some researchers back in the early two thousands, I guess two thousand eight, two thousand ten, somewhere around there. Uh, these were actually colleagues of mine at the University of Missouri when I was still working there. And they were health psychologists and they were looking at people with traumatic brain injuries. And they were specifically looking at people that had injuries to this right parietal lobe. And what they found was that people that had injuries there almost inevitably became more spiritual. It, they reported more spiritual experiences, you know, so connecting with spirits or energies or God or whatever. Um, and they also became more empathic. And so once the research came out, the media started calling it the God spot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, so I, I didn't, I didn't coin that term. And in fact, the researchers that did the research, they didn't like it at all. Right. Because, okay. <laughs> uh, they weren't saying it was the God spot, but it is catchy. Um, and the reason that it's relevant for us is because it does show up a lot. It's probably one of the main areas that shows up in the research that I've been doing with mediums in particular. Mm -hmm. And and what happens is that God spot kind of goes offline when they're doing their mediumship. And so it, it really made me investigate more, you know, like, well, what, what is this part of the brain? Like why, what's going on here? And what's interesting is that, that part of the brain, when it's normally doing its job uninterrupted, it's creating boundaries. So kind of like what we've been talking about, it's, it's creating this, this sense of, of self, but, but from a very physical standpoint. So I'm Jeff and I live in this meat suit, right? And I'm separate from you. You live in your own meat suit and we're totally separate individuals. 
So that's what that part of the brain does to some degree is it creates boundaries. And so what's interesting is that when that area gets disrupted, so it's no longer doing its normal job, well, then guess what? The boundaries don't exist anymore. So now it's easier for me to understand your perspective, right? So that empathy component, it's easier for me to understand where you're coming from and to feel how you feel. It's also easier for me to connect with people, entities, energies that are outside of myself because I don't have rigid boundaries now about that. And so for me, I feel like it's, it's really relevant for this work. Uh, and especially because it shows up so often, you mm -hmm. know, of any parts of the brain that show up in this work, that's probably number one. Uh, and it's usually going offline. So either a whole bunch of slow brainwave activity like Delta and Theta, so it's kind of like okay. shutting down. It's not doing its normal job. Um, or I've even seen it where it almost looks like seizures back there. So hmm. the person's not having a seizure. They're sitting there having a conversation. But this thing back here is just going nuts, right? It's certainly not doing its normal normal activity. Hmm. That is a big mystery, isn't it? What, what, what is your view on reality? How do you define what is real? <laughs> <laughs> so oh, wow. certainly studying about the brain <laughs> might have given you a different worldview. I'd like to explore on that. Wow. Where do I want to go with that question? Um, <laughs> so, you know, I can come at it from a couple of different angles, right? But uh, mm -hmm. I think I'm going to come at it from my personal opinion, <laughs> if that's okay. So that's fine. We're all learning. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we are, we are all learning. Right. And, and, you know, if you ask me the same question in two years, I'll probably have a different answer. Um, okay. but you know, right now my kind of feeling about, re, you know, we have reality, what is reality? Um, it, it kind of gets into the idea of consciousness, right? Like what is consciousness? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a huge question, right? And we kind of don't really know the answer. But from my own experiences and from talking to all these mediums and other people, you know, that have the capacity to extend out beyond their physical body, um, my current feeling is that consciousness imbues everything, that everything has some level of consciousness, whether it's physical or non-physical. And that on some level, whatever, I don't, even, I don't even know what we would call it, a quantum level, everything is interconnected. It's all, everything affects everything else in this sort of dynamic flow, right? It's all energy. Everything is energy and it's moving and it's flowing and it's manifesting and it's dying and it's creating. And it's just this giant rhythm of the universe. And we're just one tiny little speck of that. We're not even a speck. We're not even a speck of that. Right. Um, and, but yet we're still part of it. And so I think this is part of the mystery, right? Is that how are we both? How are we both this person in this physical body living this physical existence on this physical planet? And at the same time, we're everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And so I think this is the trick, right? Like we have to do both, right? Like at least while we're still living in this body, you have to kind of do this thing. You got to go make money. You got to, you know, pay your rent. You got to buy groceries. You have to eat, you know? Um, and at the same time, if we can remember, cause I think it's more remembering if we can remember mm -hmm that we are actually part of everything. That's where you can start to access information that you wouldn't normally access. Cause it's like, I'm not separate from it, right? It's all, it's all here. I, you know, I'm just in my own way is the only reason I can't access it. I think the civilizations that existed before us had this kind of worldview and it just kind of got buried somewhere along the line. And in, I think in Buddhism, there is a, this concept of non-duality that's, something like this if i'm yes. not wrong 
Yeah. Yeah. I think new non-duality, I think they've, I think they had it right, you know, or sort of, uh, um, yeah, Buddhism, you know, kind of gets into some of that or like, uh, Vedanta, you know, kinds of things, right. This non-dual kind of approach, kind of philosophy. And, and again, personally, I think they had it right. Um, you know, and you know, why is that? Why, why did we have this wisdom? And, you know, now we've kind of forgot about it. Um, and, you know, I think you could argue that it's, you know, because we've become so much more focused on the material world, right? Like for the most part, we don't spend as much time on our inner world. We, we don't, again, for the most part, we don't believe that these things are possible. We don't believe that there's ancestors hanging around behind us, supporting us, you know, most of us don't. Right. But if you do, if that's part of your culture, if that's how you were raised and you were in tune with nature, right. You could hear, I was just talking to somebody who's been working very intimately uh, with nature. Mm -hmm. And they were telling me this may sound crazy to some, some people, but they said they were out the other day and a big giant oak tree said hello to them. They were like, what, like, what the hell was that? Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. And I'm getting the same reaction. <laughs> yeah. You're right. You know, but, it, but it's like, and you know, we could say, well, maybe they're crazy. Maybe they were imagining it. And it's true that that could be possible. Um, but it's another possibility that, well, if you learn how to listen, can you hear the plants? Can you hear the trees? We actually know that they have their own consciousness. And again, for some people, they're like, what? That's crazy. No, this is research. Like scientists have figured this out. They can learn. Plants can learn the same way animals can learn. And, and it's like, wait a minute. What? What does that mean? They communicate with each other. Plants communicate with each other. They have vast networks of ways to communicate, you know? And so it's like, well, wait a minute. So plants have a consciousness. So if they communicate with each other, if we could tune into the right frequency, couldn't we also communicate with them? Um, what do shamans do? Shamans communicate with plants all the time, right? That's part of their work. Really? I didn't uh, know that. Yeah. And so, you know, so it, it starts to open up all these weird um, pathways, right? But, but again, if we believe that that's not possible, that that's not true, we're not even going to be open to the possibility, much less shifting into a frequency that allows us to actually tap into that, right? Because we've mm. already written it off. It's not possible. It's like, forget it. Have you, have you, have you done ayahuasca? Yes. How was that experience? <laughs> uh, if, if you're open uh, to sharing it. That's sure, yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah. I, I mean, I've, I've done ayahuasca a number of times and... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's just, you know, just like most psychedelics, uh, every experience is totally different. Right. So, um, and, but you know, I, one of my most profound experiences ever in my life was on, uh, was in an ayahuasca ceremony. Um, and the, you know, you really can't put words to it, right. It's, it's, you know, it's the ineffable, right. You know, but but of course we come back and, and we want to describe it to people and we want to remember it for ourselves. And so we, we put words on it. Um, so the only way I can really describe it that gives it any sort of the slightest amount of justice is I felt as if I was being held by a goddess and it was the most intense loving energy I've ever experienced um, by a long shot, I've never felt it. it'll probably start making me cry, even though it was like 10 years ago, because it was so intense. Um, and even in that moment where it was the most intense love I'd ever felt in my life, and I felt completely nurtured and held, I also recognized that I was experiencing this much of what was possible. And it was almost like I, I got an understanding. It was like, you can't handle more, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like there's so much more, but you can't handle it, you know? Mm. And it was like, wow. And so, you know, it just kind of, you know, you hear about people that they, they talk about their hearts being 
busted wide open. And that's what it felt like, you know, kind of coming out of that. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, like I didn't even know, know that was possible to feel like that. Um, and so of course then it's tricky, right? Because, well, what do you do with that then? You know, cause you want to hold on to it, you know? And, and I remember that when the feeling started to go away in the, in the ceremony, I was like, no, no, stay, <laughs> you know, I want to stay here forever, uh, you know, and you can't. And so that's, the, again, it's part of that trick, right? It's part of the mystery. It's like, we have, you know, we have to live in this body. We're limited by certain things. We can have these awe inspiring, amazing experiences, these transcendent experiences, really, because that was transcendent, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then we have to come back here. And so how do we do both? You know, how do we connect to both? It's tricky. Hmm. Do you think the human brain has the ability because we are doing it when we are on that drug? Can we do that naturally? I, uh, even the Eastern traditions, they have a lot of yogis and stuff that supposedly sh share these kind of stories. Yeah, no, I totally think I totally think that we can do it without those kinds of, you know, medicines. Um, but it usually takes, you know, either grace Right. So somebody, for whatever reason, they just clicked on. You hear stories mm -hmm. of that, like somebody's just doing their day to day life. And then all of a sudden they're enlightened. Right. And it's like, OK, yeah, we all wish that would happen. Right. It doesn't happen for very many people. Uh, usually people have to like work at it and devote their life to it. Right. So like some of these yogis that you're talking about, that's what the, that's their life. Like that's, that's all they do. And, you know, so again, that's, you know, that's great. Like if, if we had the time and the inclination to, to, to devote our entire lives to cultivating love, absolutely. You know, people can do that, but you know, for most of us, we probably don't want to do that for one thing. Um, you know, there's other things we want to do, <laughs> um, you know, um, and, you know, at least in sort of United States culture, you know, people aren't going to put that much effort into it, right? It's like, okay, I like, I, you know, isn't there a shortcut? Can't I get there quicker? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and, you know, people would argue about, well, you know, is, is psychedelics really cheating or is that, you know, is it the same thing or, you know, and I would argue that it probably takes you to a similar place, but it's, it's difficult. It's more difficult to sustain long-term because you didn't cultivate it yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think it can be part of somebody's journey and somebody's process to developing these abilities themselves. And I think it can kind of expedite the process sometimes, but it's not enough by itself usually. Right. And that's what you usually see. Somebody goes to a, ayahuasca retreat or they do five MEO DMT or whatever. And they have an amazing experience and they see God and they come back and they feel like they have the answers to the universe. And then a week later, they're back doing the same stupid things they were doing before, you know? And so it's, it's like, it's like the brain becomes very expansive and open. And then it starts to close back down you know, hmm. after the experience. And so the trick is like, well, how do we learn to keep it open? Right. So we can open it. We can open it with all kinds of medicines, but then how do you keep it open? Right. And so that's where the, that's where the work comes in. And it's, that's you know, it's much harder. Question. Oh, okay. Mm, interesting stories. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I was wondering like, um, uh, how does meditation help a normal person or how can it expand our consciousness from your studies? And uh, what do you teach in your neuro meditation Institute Institute? Yeah. I mean, meditation, I think in general is probably good for everybody. And in fact, you know, like when I'm teaching classes or workshops, it used to be a question that I would ask all the time, right? Is I'd have a room full of people and say, um, you know, okay, how many of you, uh, are, you know, are, are meditators, 
And so if there was a room of 50 people, five people would raise their hand, right? You know, and, and by the way, these are people who are attending a workshop on meditation, right? So clearly <laughs> they're interested in meditation. So, you know, maybe 10% are like, oh yeah, I'm a meditator. But then if you change the question and you say, how many of you have ever meditated? Every hand goes up, right? Every single hand. And so what that tells me is like, pretty much everybody understands that meditation is a good idea. <laughs> but, but the vast majority of people can't get themselves to do it on a consistent basis. You know, so we see it a lot, right? Where people say, well, you know, I tried to meditate, but I can't get my mind to be quiet. So I, I, I can't meditate or I tried to meditate and it made me anxious or whatever, whatever the thing is. And so people have a lot of ideas about what meditation is and what it isn't and about their own abilities. And so what we've tried to do with the Neuro Meditation Institute is kind of break down the way that we understand meditation to make it a little bit more user friendly so that it's easier to understand. Like, well, what are we talking about when we, because like I said earlier, like meditation isn't one thing. It's meditation is, is an umbrella that mm -hmm. in, includes lots of different practices. Okay, well, so let's understand that, right? And let's understand like, well, why do you wanna meditate? Right, everybody knows meditation's good, but why do you wanna meditate, right? Like one person might wanna meditate because they heard that it helps with sleep. And one person might wanna meditate because, um, you know, for spiritual enlightenment. Okay, well, those are two very different motivations. Right. So we probably aren't going to give them the same instructions. <laughs> okay. So right. you're saying that there are different paths. There's not like a singular way of doing it. Exactly. So, you know, what we try to do is individualize the process. So we try to individualize it so that uh, two things, one, so that the person is as likely as possible to get to whatever their goal is. Why do you want to meditate? Right. Um, and so that's part one. The other part is trying to come up with a developmental approach that respects the idea that, well, if you've never meditated before and you've got a super busy brain, you're probably not going to be able to sit down and meditate for 45 minutes the first time you, you meditate, right? Um, that's just not even appropriate, but it happens all the time. People read in a book, you should meditate for 45 minutes. And so they sit down and they make it about seven minutes and they're like, I'm going to go crazy. And so they say, well, I can't meditate. And it's like, well, what if, what if we approach this from a much more uh, developmental standpoint? And so instead of that, I said, let's start with three minutes, right? And next time I see you, let's see how that went. And then now let's try for five minutes, right? So like even just the amount of time, but not even that, like how you're sitting, or maybe you're not sitting at all. Are your eyes open? Are they closed? How are you using your attention? You know, what are you doing with your breath? Um, you know, all of these different factors, there's a million different varieties of ways that we can mix and match things so that we can help people figure out a way to engage in meditation that works for them, hmm. right? So we really try to get away from the idea that that meditation is a one size fits all prospect. It's like, well, you know, let's find something that works for you because if you do it that way, everybody can meditate and they can be successful. Um, it just takes a little bit more work, you know, to figure it out. <laughs> do, do you believe that uh, everyone should meditate or meditation can benefit humanity if, if it becomes like a norm? Sure. You know, and if we kind of go back to the idea of what we were saying earlier, right, that many different philosophies and my current philosophy is that we're all interconnected. And, and again, there's even some science behind this, right, which I'll come back to in a second. But so if we're all interconnected, doesn't that imply that all of our states of consciousness on some level affect everybody else? And so if we had 
if everybody meditated, my God, can you imagine? Could you imagine if everybody on the planet meditated? I mean, that's that that would be crazy, right? But if everybody meditated, how could that not affect sort of the global consciousness? Hmm. You know, and and again, like the research. So um, on a small scale, right, we know that if you're in the same room with somebody, particularly if it's somebody that you feel close to, right, a family member or a romantic partner or whatever, your, your brain waves will actually synchronize in certain ways. So will your heart rhythms, right? They will synchronize without even trying to do it, right? Mm. So we know that there is this kind of coherence that happens between individuals. You know, we talk about vibes. So it's like and, coronavirus. It's transmissible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it, right. It's like COVID, but in a good way, right? Um, <laughs> um, but so... You know, but there's other research, right, that um, using like random number generators. And if, you know, if if listeners aren't familiar, it's just basically a computer program that's constantly spitting out ones and zeros randomly, right? And so if you're spitting out a thousand ones and zeros a second, which, of course, computers can do no problem, that's a lot of data. Right. And if it's just running all the time. And so with that much data and it's random and you only have two options, ones and zeros. Well, when you collect enough data and you don't need that much, you're going to get about 50 percent zeros and 50 percent ones, <laughs> you know. And so what they've done with different research is they'll take these devices and put them all. They've got them all over the planet. In different hmm. places. OK. And what they found is that when there is a big event in the world, right? So the one that gets used a lot as the example is 9-11, when 9-11 happened in the United States. The random number generators didn't look random. There was a spike in the random number generators, right? Or when wow. Princess Diana died, right? So anything that captures the global attention. Attention? Yeah. Um, all of a sudden, these random number generators aren't as random anymore. Uh, they misbehave, right? And so it's like, well, what in the world? Like, what could cause that? Like, it has to be global consciousness. What else could, what, what else is going to affect that? So there's some sort of field of energy that we affect, that we affect with our consciousness. And when we're all paying attention to something, it changes. So isn't that interesting? Because what would yes. happen if we all meditated, right? Like, you know, could we affect things? I mean, absolutely. How could we not? Right? Is I think that's probably the better question. How could we not? We we would have to. But that's a really peculiar observation, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, Amazing. you know, what's interesting is so I, I've I've got my hands on, a, on my own random number generator, and I've been doing some experiments mm -hmm. with it. Okay. And, um. I've got quite a bit of data. I'm going to, I'm going to write up a, a paper one of these days um, with some of the data that I've got, but I could do a zoom call, right? With you or with anybody and put the random number generator up on the, you know, share my screen and run the random number generator. And so it's giving you some information about whether it's kicking out more ones or zeros in that given moment, right? Cause it's going to fluctuate because it's all random. But by the end of, you know, a minute and a half, you should end up with about 50% of both, right? Um, but if I show that information to somebody and I say, see if you can influence this, see if you can make more ones. Mm -hmm. it, and it doesn't matter. They can be on Zoom. They don't have to be in the room with me. Um, people can do it. They can, they can change the <laughs> outcome of, of, of the software. And it's like, whoa. You know, like, what does that mean? Right? Like, that's crazy. Cause it's like, it's on my computer and you know, this is somebody five States away and they're just looking at it on my computer screen. So clearly the information is non-local, right? It, 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 it doesn't have to be in the same room. It doesn't even have to be in the same time. 
right? So, uh, anyway, these experiments I think are very interesting because it, it makes you start to really think about what consciousness really is. Has any other conclusions been derived from this? For the one you've been saying, telling about the random generator all over the world? Um, I mean, there's, they're still doing research with it. You know, there's, um, so if you look at, uh, the Institute of heart math, mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at, uh, ions, mm -hmm. so Institute of noetic sciences, they're both involved in conducting research kind of on this, in this way, uh, looking at the impact of different events, uh, or different intentions on the random number generators in different places all over the world. I think right now they're working to, to like quadruple the number of generators that are around the world. You know, they're, they're, you know, I think there was like 80 of them at one point and they're trying to get it up to, I forget some crazy number, you know, so that they're kind of all over the place. Um, you know, and so, I mean, I don't know what, what other conclusion, I mean, I think that is the conclusion, right? Is that it's like, Oh, there, there has to be a field of consciousness, but the results were significant. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. So, yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yes. It's more than crazy. <laughs> <laughs> huh. You've worked a lot with autistic children, right? Um, at least a little bit or a little bit. Yeah. 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 A little okay. bit. Yeah. Okay. What, what happens in, in autistic brains or how are autistic people different? Elon Musk is autistic. Well, I mean, that's another big question, right? And so most of the, most of the kids and teenagers that I've worked with, um, who were, you know, somewhere on the autism spectrum, most of them were, were, you know, what we would now kind of call high functioning, right? Like before we would say Asperger's, right? Where, you know, they're verbal, they can, they can communicate, you know, they can you know, they go to school, they, you know, um, so in many ways they're, they function pretty well. Um, so that's, those, that's the population that I've spent more time with. And, uh, the, I wouldn't say there's a, cons a totally consistent brainwave pattern. Although the one thing that I've seen a lot is something that we would call hyper coherence. Mm -hmm. And so, Coherence has to do with how areas of the brain are talking to each other. So you want there to be a certain amount of communication between areas. And if things get talking too much, that can be a problem. Or if they're not talking enough, that can be a problem. And one of the things that you see or that I saw, I've heard other people report about it too, with uh, kids on the autism spectrum, is that the brain tends to be hyper coherent in fast brain waves meaning it looks like this like tangled web of communication. It's like too much communication. Hmm. And so kind of the analogy that we use sometimes is that it's kind of like rush hour traffic in LA, right? Like everybody is trying to go to the same place at the same time. And consequently there's no movement. Hmm. You know, it's like, there's too much, there's too much movement to the point that there's no movement. Right. Like things okay. kind of get like gridlocked, they get stuck. And so I, th I think that actually makes a lot of sense with what might be going on with certain autistic individuals, right? Like they have repetitive behaviors. They get stuck on certain thoughts or feelings mm -hmm. or whatever. So it, and, the brain gets switched on to the point that it feels like it's switched off. It's, it's, it's just hyper connected. There's just so many mm -hmm. connections, which also mm -hmm. might be why they, they often feel very sensitive right? Like they're sensitive to certain kinds of sensory information. Uh, so sound or touch, right? It's like, if things are hyper connected, you know, things could feel overwhelming. It's like too much information, you know, coming in. So something that somebody who's not autistic might experience as nice or pleasant might feel overwhelming, right? Cause it's just, there's, there's too many, there's, there's too many firings that are happening with, you know, something that seems relatively simple. Hmm. Hmm. No, what I was trying to think is that earlier you told me that the uh, consciousness expands when we switch off our brain. And 
and in autism it's just the opposite everything is getting hyperactive so i was seeing if we could make a connection there yeah well now and i was talking you know specifically about kind of the the population that i was working with which were you know very high functioning i think things are different when you start looking at nonverbal uh autistic individuals and and mm-hmm. you know that might have been where you were going because we did a little bit of research with nonverbal autistic individuals who are also telepathic um and so so far i've i've met i've worked with three different autistic individuals who were telepathic with their primary caregiver with their mother mm-hmm. and so they would communicate by pointing to a letter or a number board so they could communicate but they but not verbally right so they would spell things out by pointing to you know letters on a board and you know in the three instances that i saw they were virtually 100% accurate with uh telling us what the mom was seeing or thinking or you know we could we could have the mom pull a book off of a bookshelf open it to a random page pick a sentence and then close the book and then the kid would spell out the exact sentence Right. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so for me, I mean, you know, that was another one of those jaw dropping kinds of experiences, right? Where when you see that, it's kind of like, whoa, okay, wait a minute. Like, <laughs> what does this mean? Right. You know, but um, I think the fact that they're nonverbal is important uh, and, and why they have this ability. Uh you know, it may be that their telepathic senses are more heightened because they don't communicate verbally, right? And so the other thing that we see is that the left hemisphere, which is where, for most people, all the language processing is happening, um, is another one of those ways that we uh, limit information. When we use words, we limit information, right? Mm -hmm. So just like my experience with the ayahuasca, where I said, we can't, it's hard to describe these things, right? Like we, we talk about it, but it really doesn't do it justice. Yeah. Um, and so one of my earlier guests, he told me that linguistics is the least, not the least, it's a less efficient mechanism of communication. We can't really put out what we feel or what we experience. Right, exactly. And so the fact that they don't use words that way, I think makes them more receptive to other ways of getting information, right? And other ways of communicating. Mm. Uh, so, you know, it also keeps them out of the left hemisphere, which is much more linear, logical, structured. Think about how language works. It's linear, logical, structured, right? Whereas the right hemisphere is much more open. It's spacious. It's exper- it's, it's sensory. It's experiential. It's in the moment. So if you're spending more time on the right hemisphere, you know, you're much more likely to tap into that kind of information. So, you know, I think, you know, I think that's an interesting, you know, it would be a fun study is to look at people who have had a stroke in the left hemisphere uh, and see if, if it enhances any of their telepathic, telepathic. abilities. <laughs> that's an interesting idea. Should probably not laugh on it, but uh. <laughs> no, but but uh, you know how else are you going to sort of study that idea, right? You know, um, you know. I mean, you could do things. So here's another example: the, the research study just came out. I've actually got the paper sitting right here, uh, mm-hmm. and they um, they used repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation on the left frontal lobe. Mm-hmm. So that language expression area. And they use it to shut that part of the brain down temporarily. Right. So they, they shut down the left frontal lobe and then they had people doing these random number generator tests and they did better on the tests. Okay. <laughs> after they shut down this left frontal lobe. It's uh, because what separate us as humans from other animals is just this ability to communicate language. We are, we have almost like all other instincts that animals have, 
and i think our our brain has structured itself to develop based on language and i think that has altered our consciousness in a very different direction am i right to say that i, I think that's fair you know um i mean it's probably more, more complicated than that right but i mean everything's more complicated uh I think that's certainly a big chunk of it, right? Is the way that we've, I mean, you know, our brains are bigger than, you know, most other animals. And by bigger, I don't mean just size wise, right? The way that they function, they're more complex. And again, that, that might complicate things, you know, like in some ways it's good. We can think, we can analyze, we can problem solve, we can predict the future. We can do all kinds of stuff that other animals may not be able to do as well, but then it also limits our more intuitive information. Right. It's, mm. I, I think that's what happens, right? Like it's a give and take. And we, I think maybe we've gone too far on one side, you know, we, mm. we, we valued that left brain kind of way of doing things way more than the right brain. And so maybe it's time to pendulum back a little bit. Is, is and, uh, there a way to enhance our intu intuitions? Yeah. I mean, the biggest way is to, you know, uh, stop talking to ourselves and, and listen, right? So it's like, if we can shut down the left hemisphere and tap more into that right hemisphere, um, that goes a long way. And so, but it takes, it takes practice, right? Because we're so accustomed to thinking about everything. You know, thinking hmm. involves language for most people. You know, if you think about it, like, well, how do you think? It's like, well, you're talking to yourself in your head. Hmm. You're using words. You're just using them in your own head. Hmm. You know, and so yeah, still... I, som I sometimes think how dumb and deaf people think, like who are born dumb and deaf. They think they think on Braille. However, they learn a way of language. That's how people think. Yeah. Right. And so maybe they have a different way of processing the information, which would be interesting to, to examine. I just want to talk a little bit more about like, just a little bit about energy healers, because you sent me the email the other day, you were going to measure, uh, Tai Chi energy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. So what I was measuring was I, I had the opportunity to work with a, um, you know, a Qigong, a, a Taoist, uh, priest really, um, and he's a Qigong master. And one of the things that he is very skilled at is transmitting Qi. So Qi is, you know, the, the life force, the, uh, the energy that moves through the body. And so he's got this practice of being able to just put his fingers on somebody else's palm and direct energy into that other person. And so, you know, this is sort of for healing and opening energy channels in the body. And so I was able to measure his brain uh, during a couple of these sessions. And uh, yeah, it was very interesting because uh, I'd have to go back and look at the data to make sure I had, I'm saying everything exactly correct. But he was doing something that I actually see a fair amount of with other kinds of work as well where the slow brain waves, the delta and the theta increased dramatically, but so did the, the fastest brain waves. Hmm. So we see this a lot, like the slowest and the fastest are the ones that increase and everything else just kind of hangs out. And okay. what my theory is that the slow brain waves are allowing them to access this deeper state of consciousness you know, whatever it is, right? Tap into the field of information, however they're doing that. And the fastest brain waves are allowing them to bring it back into physical reality, right? So hmm. it's kind of a little bit of like, like you got to do both. Because if you just had slow brain waves, you'd probably be in a trance. You know, you'd be spaced out. You may not even remember what the hell happened, right? You just sort of like float off into space. Um, and if you only had the fast brain waves, it'd be like, zzz, you know, it'd be very intense. Um, and it might be harder to tap in. So it's almost like you got to have a little bit of both uh, okay. to pull that off. Okay. And that's kind of what we saw. Okay. It, it kind of it now reminds me of that maintaining that experience that we talked about earlier. 
you know it's it's about people do that psychedelic experience and they get into that world and they expand their consciousness and they lose it eventually in a week two week whatever and maybe this is how we do it maybe that's a good way to look at it yeah yeah i think it is okay. i think it's i think it's at least one way <laughs> okay okay let's end it on a philosophical note what is your meaning of life or what what do you think you were born <laughs> uh Boy, I wish I knew, you know, I mean, I, um, I, you know, I don't even, I still, I'm not a hundred percent sure kind of what my purpose is, right. You know, like mm -hmm. much less the larger purpose. Um, I feel like, or, or even if we have a purpose at all, I don't know, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. it, I think it depends on which perspective you want to come from, right. Because from sort of a transcendental non-dualistic perspective, I'm not even sure that's the right question, right? Because it's, it's, it's kind of like we are everything and kind of like I was saying, things manifest and they de-manifest and, you know, this is one of infinite numbers of possibilities of how this life does and could and would exist, you know, mm -hmm. all, all in that, in that realm, all possibilities exist simultaneously. Mm -hmm. I just happen to be tapping into this one, Right. And so it's like, well, you know, uh, it's almost kind of a hard question, right? Because it's like, well, you know, who knows? Or, you know, do we get into karma, right? Like, well, what, what's my purpose? Like, what, what is it that I'm supposed to work out here? Like, why, do, why am I born this way, right? Uh, and in this set of circumstances, what is it I'm supposed to learn? Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, at, at this point in my life, I almost don't even worry about it too much except just like, you know, what, what brings me joy and how can I help others? Right. And if I can do what brings me joy and helps others, then maybe that's enough. You know, maybe I don't have to have it mm -hmm. all figured out because I'm not sure I can. <laughs> or, or maybe we don't even have to, you know, just yeah. experience things as yeah. they are. Maybe we don't have to. Mm -hmm. that, that was my last question. What's Jeff Tarrant as a brain scientist is message to the world in a sentence. Maybe we can put that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, okay, if I had to come up with a message to the world in one sentence, um, I would say, learn to trust your instincts. Listen, like, I think we have way more wisdom inside of us than most people have any idea. And we don't listen to it. And I think it causes us a lot of trouble. So, you know, it's like when you hear that little voice, like it's there for a reason and whether you want to attribute it to something spiritual or just your own subconscious doesn't matter. Right. It's like, it's a wisdom. And so if we can learn to listen to that wisdom, I think it can take us a long way. Okay. And in order to do that, learn to quieten your mind. Exactly. Thank you so much for your time and for all that you're doing and please keep up the good work and uh, <laughs> hope you enjoy and, Thank you. Where can people find you so that yeah. people can get in touch with you and your institute and if they want to learn about meditation and your books and all that you're putting out to the world? Yeah, thanks. So we have two websites. One of them is www.psychicmindscience.com. Mm -hmm. So obviously that's going to be more of the psychic uh, research and resources and all of that. The other one is www.neuromeditationinstitute.com. Obviously, that one's going to be geared a little bit more toward the meditation aspects for mental wellness. So there's going to be some overlap, but uh, those two resources are probably the best way to get, you know, all the resources, information, check out our classes and, you know, that kind of thing. Well, that was Dr. Jeff Tarrant sharing his views on about human consciousness and how the human brain might have infinite capabilities if we are looking to expand them and how we as humans have a long way to go to expand our consciousness and enjoy our life in a different way or a, or, or a bit more conscious way on this earth. I hope you all found the conversation interesting and support us so that we can have more interesting sessions with more interesting people. <laughs>